This is a story about a series of murders and disappearances that happened in the winter of 2000, previously on a new winter. When I awoke, all I could hear was the ding, ding, ding of a light somewhere inside the car going off. It was completely dark now, but in front of me the headlights shone into an icy field. we come off the road. I looked beside me to where Michael had been, and the door was open. But, more worryingly, there was pieces of his clothes scattered on his seat, and blood. I got out to see what had happened, but as I peered into the darkness, I might as well have had my eyes shut. There was nothing. There was nothing, and I was alone. This is episode 29 of A New Winter. In front of the car, where the headlight shone, was a trail of blood. Not heavy bleeding, but enough for me to see it. Should I follow? I had no idea where I was. I ran back over to the driver's side and saw the keys were still in the car. I looked around. I had to try something, at the very least. Hello, I shouted. Michael? Silence. And then, the shriek. Then a couple more, from different areas, joining in a chorus. Then another sound, a growl, more than a shriek. But this time it was nearer. That was all I needed. I jumped into the driver's seat, my clothes now stained with blood, and I hit reverse until I was back on the road. And then I was off. I drove as fast as I could through the narrow country roads without thinking about oncoming traffic or black ice. The wheels were skidding along, at points pulling up the snow. I was almost out of control. I raced along, and as I did so, visions started occurring. The darkness of the outside world, my mind filling the void with what had happened. Of the Madame's murder in the line, of Nicola, of Henry, and then... Suddenly, a little girl appeared on the road. For an instant, a moment, I looked into her eyes and I recognised her. She was in the room with Mr Tooley, back when I first met him. Back when I'd come through the used. She stared straight at me, fearless, cold. I quickly swerved the car and lost control. I must have hit her. I didn't hear anything, but there was no chance she could have got out of the way in time. The car spun around and came off the road. I was placed, facing the road from the other side, my headlights shining onto where the girl had just stood. But nothing. Had she run away? I got out of the car. I couldn't wander around too long. They would be coming for me, the masked ones. I ran up to the road and I saw nothing, just the tyre marks where I'd hit the brakes and come off the road. Had I killed her? Had I killed the little girl? I ran back to the car and, with what little light I had, I investigated the bumper, but nothing. Not a scratch, nor a dent. Then I felt something, like I was being watched. A heavy, dark presence was behind me. I half expected someone to tap me on the shoulder and I just froze completely stiff I didn't know whether I was frozen out of fear or whether it was the cold or maybe some kind of spell had been put on me but I soon took control of my senses and I turned around sharply and there standing in the middle of the road was the little girl staring right back at me. It felt as though the world had grown quiet, like time had paused. The little girl was mouthing something, but I couldn't, I couldn't hear her. What is it? I asked. What are you saying? I edged closer, and as I did so, I could feel a panic and unsettling anxiety stirring within me. The tower listens, she was saying. The tower listens. The tower listens. What do you mean, I asked. What's your name? Sandra, she replied, 
and pointed to her right. And there, in front of me, reaching up to the sky, was the tower. It was overwhelming. It was filling my entire vision. The road had fallen away, and a storm had suddenly taken its place, and I was in its shadow, looking into my soul. It lifted me towards myself, enveloping me and drowning me. The tower listens, and then I awoke. Jesus, mate, you're sweating. It was Michael. He was still in the driver's seat beside me. Who's this Sandra, then? Uh, excuse me? Sandra, he repeated. It's what you just kept going on about. Some missus of yours, is she? Bit of tie? Um, no. I looked around. I, I was in the car, and we'd stopped. We were back in town. I recognised the Bell Hotel. We must have been just around the corner, actually, from the Lime. How long have I been asleep, I asked. I don't know, about ten minutes. I did tell you that we weren't far. Ten minutes? I, I feel like it's been hours. Well, it hasn't. Um, but look, I've got to check in now. Do you know where you're going? Um, kind of, I said. I mean, I don't, I don't actually have anywhere to go. Michael looked at me in pity. Well, I was homeless once, he said. Well, homeless. I mean, I ran away. Ran away from my mum and dad. God, I'd had it. They were complete bastards. Didn't give a shit about me. All they cared about was my brother. The bloody golden child. They didn't even bother looking for me. They could not give more of a shit. That's why I'm here. Why I'm back. Home. I want to show off how I made it. All the money that I made, all of which I did by myself. Not one bit of help from them. I'm retired now. Made enough money to live out the end of my days quite nicely. He looked at me and smiled gently. Yeah, well, I'm boring the shit out of you, aren't I? Look, tell you what. Stay here, and I'll get you another room. Stay as long as you like. Just don't touch the bloody mini bar or start ordering room service. Really? I said. Thanks. But I couldn't believe my luck. In fact, it felt like it was almost too good to be true. What's the catch? I asked. Hmm? No catch, mate. Just trying to help a brother out. I mean, you don't have to if you don't want it. I mean, I don't mind. It's up to you. But what choice did I really have? Here was this guy rides up out of nowhere and suddenly comes and saves the day. Oh, it just didn't make sense. But then nothing was making sense. I needed to find the answers instead of getting more questions. I needed to figure out what was going on, who was involved, and what this town was truly hiding. If this guy Michael wants to help me out, if he can at least put a roof over my head, then why not? I just have to keep a careful eye on him. That's all. Okay, I said. Uh, thanks, that'd be great. Michael smiled. <laughs> no problem. He checked us in, and I walked into room 108. It had a window that, if you looked out, you could just about see the lime. There was no activity, nothing. Just stood there, motionless, empty. I got flashbacks of Nicola slitting the madam's throat. I remember hiding the footage of myself and Mr. Tooley killing Nikolai. I had to find out more about what was happening here. I mean, I needed to talk to someone. And in its own strange way, I felt like the only person I could trust, the only person whom I felt would probably give me a straight answer, was Mr. Tooley. But where would I go to see him? I mean, could he still be at the old house? It was still the middle of the day, so I decided to get some sleep and rest up and head out under the cover of night and go and see him. I needed to keep my head down for the moment. I had no idea who was after me, if anyone was truly after me at all. I set my alarm for 10pm and slept. I don't think I'd slept so well in a long time. I felt safer here, slightly stronger more alive. But 
what changed. I'd woke up refreshed and clearer and more focused. I didn't have any more supplies. In fact, I had nothing. I looked in the mirror, and even though I felt like I'd had a good sleep, I looked tired and pale and drawn. I decided I'd have a shower before I went out, really scrub under my nails and behind the ears. Just before I was about to undress, there was a knock on the door. Hello? Oh, hey, it's Michael. I opened up to see him standing there with a pile of clothes. Hey, um, nothing weird, but... Seems it looks like you don't have, well... Well, you don't have anything. Then I thought I'd just lend you some stuff. I mean, you know, something clean at least. He handed me the pile of clothes. Yeah, uh, yeah, great, thanks, I said. He nodded and walked back to his room. I looked at what he gave me. It's a pair of jeans, a t-shirt, a hoodie, and some new underwear in a fancy box. And just some sports socks. I tried not to be suspicious, but I couldn't help it. I went over all the clothes of my fingers, looking for just anything out of the ordinary. Microphones, cameras. I didn't really know, but... Yeah, just anything. But they looked fine. I mean, maybe he was just a nice guy. I showered and got changed into my new clothes. They were loose, but comfortable. I grabbed my hotel key and went out into the dark night. I walked. In fact, the silence was deafening. It put me on edge. I mean, I was paranoid enough as it was, but I literally felt like the only person alive. The last person in the world walking through the dark under the orange glow of a flickering lamplight, walking towards Mr. Tooley, towards that place, voluntarily. After a while, I came across the house. I walked up to the front, but as I did so, a man came out. I quickly fell to the icy cold ground so as not to be spotted. The man must have heard because he looked my way. Had he seen me? I just wasn't sure. I couldn't make out his features. He was hidden within the shadows, but he took a step forward. And I could see in the light that it wasn't a man at all. It was a woman. It was Jackie. What was Jackie doing there? Whom did she go to see? Mr. Tooley? Can't be right. I mean, she was... Involved, part of his gang, I suppose. Perhaps he'd returned for some more sex games. I could see her still trying to make out something in my direction, in the darkness where I was hiding. I stayed low. I didn't dare move an inch. She retreated back into the shadows, and what began as a rushed walk from the house turned into a jog and then a run. Why was she running like that? Once I was sure she was gone, I stood back up and continued towards the house. But now, I was a lot more wary. I didn't want anyone coming out at the last minute to surprise me. Especially if it was someone like the lion, who could probably rip me apart with his bare hands. As I approached the house, I could feel a rush run down my spine. And I shivered. I could feel the hairs of my arms shoot up. Something was happening inside. I could feel it. As I opened the door, the door to the house where I used to live, I could see how it was just as I left it that night. The night of... of Nicola. And I could hear Mr. Tooley's voice calling me in, into the lounge, as he was sitting by the fire. But that was just in my head, or a memory. Rather than feeling the slight warmth of the fire from before, the house instead was just completely icy cold. The lights were on, but there was, there was nothing. I didn't dare say anything, not a noise. I only wanted to find Mr. Tooley, and if he wasn't here, I'd go back to the hotel and just consider what to do next. I didn't want to meet anyone else. But as I turned into the lounge, there was nothing that prepared me for what I saw. For the room looked the same as before. 
except lying in the middle, was a stack of bodies, one lying on top of the other. My heart started to race. I stood there, dumbfounded. What was I supposed to do? Should I run? Call the police? Again? I mean, I should probably check if they're alive, right? I took a deep breath, and I just I looked around the room. There was no signs of any altercation. There was nothing smashed or, or knocked over. I couldn't see any blood. It was as if they'd been perfectly placed and balanced, like an intricate game. I felt sick, and the mere sight of this perverse setup was more than disturbing, to say the least. But who were they? They were dressed, and it looked like there's three men and a woman. I walked around to the front so I could make out their faces. However, there's nothing really that can prepare you for that look. And that look of death. If you've ever seen a dead body that's died in pain, then you'll know the look that I speak of. The eyes rolled back, the mouth twisted, the skin grey. It was a horror I was stupidly unprepared for. My stomach turned even further, and it was enough not to just throw up on the floor right there and then. But I knew I had to leave no evidence here. I doubt Dewbridge could have get me out of this one. If he believed I didn't do it in the first place, that is. I tried to make out the faces and just see if I recognised anyone. And I did. One was the skinny man with that moustache. I'd met him under this very house, in fact. And he was the one that introduced me to Mr. Tooley. The other, the woman, it was Inspector Grahams, Dewbridge's partner. I sighed, he isn't going to like the look of this. But then I noticed something, something almost poking out of her mouth. I grabbed my shirt and using it to stop myself from leaving any fingerprints, I slowly opened up her mouth and pulled out what was inside. It was a key, a small silver key. I turned it around in my hand. What was this for? Why had she hidden it? What was it doing in her mouth? Then suddenly, I saw a beam of light shine across the room. It was a car pulling up outside. I had to leave immediately. I crouched down and made my way through to the back, to what was the kitchen. But as I approached the back door, I heard some talking, and someone was coming that way as well. I went to go back to the front, but already I could see some flashlights start bouncing from the outside. I was trapped. I looked around, feeling like an animal backed into a corner. Then I remembered something. I remember the chanting. And then I looked up to see the door under the stairs. The door to the underground. The door I'd gone through with. With Mr. Tooley and Nicola. There was no time to think about it. I quickly went through and shut it behind me. I looked down the stairs and followed them down. The red light. Still shining. Beckoning me in. My saviour. I went down and into the maze of corridors, and I felt an unbearable weight upon me. Surely if the police were upstairs, they'd finally crack down on this place, and no doubt find this labyrinth. But if it wasn't the police, well, if it wasn't the police, then maybe this would be the first place they'd look. I had to move fast. I started walking around the corridors, and remembered when Dubridge saved me. When we escaped, there were other exits leading to the other buildings. I just had to find the right one. I didn't like the fact that I was here by myself, creeping through these corridors, all of which looked just alike as the next. Where did they all go? How many were there? How did they create such a maze underneath this land? As I walked through further, I noticed one of the doors slightly ajar. I looked at the handle and noticed a lock. Perhaps the key was meant for one of these doors, but as soon as I tried it I realised it wasn't even close. 
I pushed the door slightly further open to reveal a small white room with bright strip lighting, very different from the red glow of the rest of this place. It's clear to see why, though, because pushed up against each of the walls was a series of filing cabinets. I counted them. There was nine in total. I went to open one, but it was locked shut. Then the other. Damn it. But then I realised the key. Maybe Graham's was here. I mean, Anne Dubridge said that she'd, she'd gone away, though. What happened here? I had to try and get inside the filing cabinets. And I tried the key. And it did fit. But it wouldn't turn. I went to the next, but nothing. And then, well, third time's the charm. The key turned. I quietly pulled open the top drawer. And inside there were files that seemed to be separated by years. 1982 was at the back of the drawer. 1975 was at the front. As I took the files out, I could see it was a combination of all sorts of documents. There were mysterious blood test results, with notes scrawled on them. Average, normal behaviour, and as predicted. Signed off by what looked like a Dr. Carver. Then there were missing person files, pictures of young children smiling back at me. Pages and pages on their last whereabouts, their families. And then on the back pages... Stamps saying deceased on all of them. Those pictures of their crumpled bodies lying in forests and in some cases just the occasional body part. Or even worse, a burnt up charred corpse. I put them back and closed the top drawer. I just couldn't see any more of that. It was clear enough that children had disappeared here. They'd maybe been murdered, chopped up or burnt. And I wondered where they were. And if they had anything to do with that disgusting mass grave that I'd fallen in not so long ago. They opened the second drawer, 1974 at the back. 1953 at the front this time. Jesus, how long has this been going on for? Still, there were missing children cases. Strange blood test results by the same Dr. Carver. And then documents on some of the town folk. Things like marriage certificates, planning permissions. Some were just handwritten notes on what was happening with a family called the Storrups. They looked as if they were under some kind of surveillance for what seemed like a great deal of time. But there was lots of other things. There seemed to be reports stashed of strange incidents around the town. One was a woman saying her dead husband had returned and spent the night with her Another of a homeless man being attacked by an invisible force. And just other weird occurrences. I mean, how far back did this go? Why were they here? I closed the drawer and opened up the last one at the bottom. This one was 1952 to 1942. It was more of the same. Missing children, strange incidents, murder cases. But then I noticed a photo... Old black and white photo. It was of two boys running into the forest, and on the right hand side, on the right hand side in the back of the picture, was what looked like a black smudge. But it was impossible. It was behind the trees, it was in the photograph. But what made me even more terrified, in fact, what shook me to my very core, is that the boys were twins. And more than that, I realised who they were. They were me. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. For more info, including how you can support the show, please visit anewwinter.com. Thank you for listening to A New Winter. <laughs>